Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Now, apologies for the brief hiatus. Last Monday, I was otherwise preoccupied, but I am back now, here to bring you the latest Starship news, space launch updates, and all the other cool events that happened over the past seven days. And we have lots to discuss once again. From flying sparks on Ship 31, the rise of NASA's Mobile Launcher 2, SpaceX revealed its sleek EVA suit, Boeing Starliner unfortunately faces more delays, Starlink expands by almost 90 satellites, China debuted its Long March 6C rocket, and its second ever lunar sample return mission has reached the moon, and much, much more. Enjoy. Late last week, over the cover of Nightfall, SpaceX rolled out Ship 31 out of its Starbase production facility, sending it down to the Macy's test site to begin its testing campaign which turned out would go on to spark some rather shocking results. <laughs> Ship 31 will be the starship used for Flight 5, and its initial cryo-testing at Macy's seemed initially to go very well. However, we then saw a dramatic and sustained flash of light erupting from its fuselage. Unfortunately, due to the fog and distance from the camera, it's hard to pinpoint the exact location, but here's a zoomed-in photo of the ship from Starbase Surfer. The electrical arc appeared to have burst out from the cable raceway. Not sure what triggered the fault and what specific systems were affected, there's quite a lot more to the ship than just fuel tanks and engines. Lots of electrical systems are required to make starships work, like the forward and aft flap actuators, flight computers, engine actuators, sensors, and so on, so any or all of these systems might be affected. Hopefully the fault isn't severe enough to have a meaningful delay on Flight 5. At the end of the day, we still haven't even seen Flight 4 yet, and that's not going to be soon, soon. According to Elon, SpaceX are aiming for three to five weeks for the launch of this one, with the main mission objective being to get further than Flight 3, ideally with Starship surviving the maximum heat of hypersonic re-entry and successful controlled booster splashdown. Reminder that, according to Elon, if Flight 4 is a complete success, then Flight 5 will see SpaceX make their first attempt at catching Super Heavy from the air with the chopsticks, which uh, is going to be crazy to see. Speaking of Flight 5, perhaps the most exciting test we saw at Starbase last week was a static fire test of all six Raptor engines for Flight 5 Starship, also known as Ship 30, which will fly with Booster 12. The test by all accounts appeared to be a success, which means no more testing is required from Ship 30 before full stack for Flight 5. Shortly after completing the static fire, Ship 30 was hooked up to a crane before being lifted off the static fire pad and then rolled back down to the production site. Anyway, cryo-testing of Ship 31 wasn't the only test we saw at Macy's. Alongside it, you can now see the outline of the starship that just refuses to be scrapped, Ship 26. It's standing on this, a new mobile starship static fire test stand. In this photo, it's being moved from Macy's to Mega Bay 2, which is where Ship 26 was moved just over a week ago. Inside the Mega Bay, Ship 26 was stacked onto the stand using the building's bridge cranes before being rolled out together, meaning that cranes aren't going to be needed for ship static fire stacking at Macy's. It's all done at the production site. Why Ship 26? Well, we don't know, but it might be because this is the first test of the stand, and SpaceX would rather use a non-flight vehicle for its first use, rather than risking a flight starship. Where is Ship 29 though? That's the next starship to fly, but we've not really seen it very much recently. That's because crews are still working on its heat shielding in the high bay, having removed and replaced a substantial number of tiles, and meticulously testing and inspecting each and every one, likely based upon data gathered from Flight 3, which saw a significant loss of tiles during ascent. Tile work may well be virtually completed now though, as later in the week, Ship 29 was removed from the high bay and transported to Mega Bay 2, the new main facility for ship processing. Ship 29 is still expected to be the ship used for Flight 4, and it'll fly atop Booster 11, which was residing in Mega Bay 1 until very recently. We saw it rolled out of the Mega Bay and down to the launch site into the arms of the chopsticks and then lifted up onto the orbital launch mount. We're now on the final stretch of testing before the next orbital flight test of Starship. Check out Star Factory. This massive building is nearing completion. It's looking very sleek with its glasswork almost fully installed now. 
I would love to see the production line inside. Seeing how raw steel becomes spaceships in a single building, sans final stacking of course, would be fascinating and probably isn't going to be something we ever get a chance to see, at least in full, but SpaceX have certainly come a long way from the tents that Starbase started out with. Just down the road, the new office building is also making great progress. I love helicopters. <laughs> And we saw one at Starbase last week, specifically a sky crane, which was seen lifting large HVAC units, something quite commonly done with helicopters. Those things are heavy multi-ton rooftop units, and the speed and maneuverability of a helicopter often makes them a better solution than a normal crane. So yeah, cool. On May the 4th, SpaceX gave us a first look at their new EVA suits, as in spacesuits that are designed to keep astronauts alive outside of a spacecraft. No sooner than summer this year, SpaceX will launch Polaris Dawn, and during this five-day Crew Dragon mission, the crew will conduct SpaceX's first ever spacewalk from Dragon, which will also be the world's first ever commercial spacewalk, as well as the first time ever that four astronauts will be exposed to the vacuum of space at the same time. But one thing I've seen a lot of people comment on is, how is it that the suit is so slim? A lot of SpaceX critics, and by that I mean people who think anything with Elon's name attached is fraudulent for some reason, have labelled it as putting form over function. I mean, comparing it to the suits worn on shuttle and ISS EVAs, that seems fair, right? Except, no, those suits are designed to fully support astronauts without the spacecraft. They have fully self-contained life support systems, so shots like this are possible. The SpaceX EVA suits don't have this. They require the astronauts to be tethered to the spacecraft via an umbilical, and it's Dragon that contains all the life support stuff. A more apt comparison would be the Gemini EVA suits, which are much slimmer than the normal astronaut suits you normally associate with NASA, because here the astronauts were again tethered to the spacecraft for life support. Last week, we saw another bunch of Starlink launches. To be honest, talking about these is now a hallmark of these videos, and really there's not much to discuss since they're all virtually identical, so I'll just summarise them all really quickly now. We saw four Falcon 9 Starlink missions over the past week, with another one scheduled to launch later today. It may have already launched by the time you're watching this video. In total, SpaceX's Starlink constellation grew by 89 satellites in total, including 13 with direct-to-cell capabilities. All four first stage boosters made successful drone ship landings, and hopefully the one launching later today makes it down in one piece safely as well. Artemis 4 will see the debut of NASA's bigger, beefier space launch system Block 1B, and to support this massive rocket, they're going to need a new mobile launch platform. Construction of this has been underway for quite some time now, but we did see NASA reach a rather big milestone last week, with the completion of the Jack and Set process. This involved raising and positioning the structure onto permanent mount mechanisms using specialised equipment, including the spaceport's crawler transporter. This structure weighs in at almost 1,200 metric tonnes, or 5 million McDonald's Big Macs for all you Americans watching. The completion of Mobile Launcher 2 will be a big step towards returning humans to the surface of the moon, beginning with Artemis 4, and preparing for future missions to Mars and even beyond. We saw the debut of a new rocket last week. China's Long March 6C is a single stick variant of Long March 6A, and it made its maiden flight last Tuesday, carrying four Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit, succeeding too, with all four satellites now operational. We also saw a Long March 4C and a Long March 3BE launch from China last week. The 3BE launched on Thursday, carrying two communication satellites to medium Earth orbit on behalf of Tsinghua University while the 4C launched on Saturday, carrying a single technology demonstration satellite to low Earth orbit. Now, this launch technically didn't happen last week. It happened during that week I wasn't around to record a space this week, but it is still something I want to talk about because, well, it's very cool. On the 3rd of May, China launched a Long March 5, carrying the Chang'e 6 mission, China's second ever lunar sample return mission, and the world's first lunar sample return mission from the far side of the moon, providing valuable insights into lunar composition and the early solar system. The mission involves a series of complex manoeuvres, including the deployment of a lunar lander, orbiter, rover and a sender. Last Wednesday, the spacecraft successfully performed a braking manoeuvre entering elliptical lunar orbit. The next phase will be a landing and sample collection, and once the samples are collected, they'll be returned to Earth firstly by re-entering lunar orbit via the ascent module, and then back to Earth via a re-entry capsule. Very exciting stuff to see. 
One launch we hoped we would see last week was the maiden crewed flight of Boeing Starliner. This would have been a historic mission if it had happened, the 100th Atlas V launch, first launch of humans on an Atlas vehicle since Gordon Cooper on Mercury Atlas 9 in 1963, and the first launch of humans on an Atlas V. But sadly, it wasn't to be. About two hours before liftoff, a valve issue on the Atlas V rocket flared up and prevented launch. ULA boss Tori Bruno elaborated that sometimes valves can get into a position where they start to buzz by opening and closing rapidly. He then said that these buzzes have happened before and cycling the valve often fixes the issue, so if the payload here was a satellite, it would have almost certainly launched and be in orbit right now, but with humans on board, ULA have much stricter tolerances, so the launch was scrubbed and the rocket was rolled back. So basically everything was probably fine, but ULA's self-imposed strictness for human spaceflight meant that they had to abort, which is absolutely not a bad thing. Hopefully the next attempt goes well. I'm sure you've all heard the news now, but if you haven't, well, it's a topic I covered in my latest Kerbal Space Program video. Take-Two Interactive has shut down Intercept Games, the developer behind KSP2, and so the future of the game's development is looking increasingly uncertain. While the official Twitter account has posted that they are still working hard on the game, we have no concrete information pertaining to how this will be possible with no developer studio, or if the game is transferring to a different team, or, well, anything, really. And so in my latest video, given that there are no KSP2 devs to talk to, I instead had a good old chat with Harvester, the creator of Kerbal Space Program 1, to get his thoughts on the entire KSP2 thing, <laughs> as well as share some history on how KSP came to be in the first place. I'm really happy with how the video turned out, and I got some really positive feedback on it. So if you haven't seen it yet, then check it out by clicking the card on screen. You can also see my Patreon supporters on the left there. It's their generous support that really makes this content possible, so your support is always appreciated. But that's it from me today. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll catch you in the next one.